if you feel anxious, if you feel angry, if you feel sad, if you feel depressed or paralyzed or overwhelmed or helpless, that is a rational response to what's happening today. It is not abnormal. It is not strange. It is a completely rational response to what the science is telling us and to what we see governments around the world not doing. So that's where we have to start. That is a absolutely normal response. And then the question is, what do we do with it? everybody. Um, I'm Paul Beckwith and uh, with me I've got uh, Catherine Hayhoe and we're at the uh, COP15 in Montreal, Canada. And um, this is yet another conference after COP27 in um, Egypt. Um, so, so you just had a panel um, and you said that the um, the biggest question was, you know, what gives you hope? So my question is, do you always have the same answer to that? Or is your answer evolving and changing with each, each time you're asked that question? Well, my primary answer isn't changing, but the examples that, so the, that are at the front of my mind are always changing. Because what gives me hope is not the science that shows that climate is changing faster than any time in the history of humans on this planet. Not the science that tells us that we have to stop all new oil and gas and coal extraction, uh, exploration and we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels as soon as possible. But what gives me hope is when I look around and I see all of the people who are taking action. It could be children, students, parents or grandparents. It could be people who work at an organization or a business or for the government or for an educational institution or a tribal nation. When we look around the world at all the people who are taking action, that's what gives me hope. And so my answer is always the same, but my answer is also always different because every day I hear a new story that gives me hope. Now, yeah, I mean, personally, it's I'd have a very similar answer. It, it's, uh, you know, taking action and, you know, everybody has different skill set, right? I mean, some of us are educators, there's academics, whatever you're doing in your life, I figure look for what you're best at and try to, you know, uh, leverage that to getting the word out. Because, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, we really need pressure on governments to, to do the right thing. They, they're not they, they're not doing it on their own. So. <laughs> they need lots of, of, of help. And, and uh, you know, luckily, I mean, there's so many things going on at these cops. I always find it difficult to, I always find I'm missing things I really wanted to see. So, you know, your email with uh, Talking Climate with Catherine Hayhoe, the email just came yesterday and I thought, ah, two o'clock, that's where I, where I have to be. Um, so we were talking about nature-based solutions and uh, other people call it uh, ecosystem restoration as a part of it. Um, one of the things that concerns me is this, uh, do people really know what they're talking about by 3030? Like it's supposed to be 30% of land. Does that include 30% of the oceans? And what sort of geometry are we talking about? Because if you just have a sort of a circular area in the middle of a country, um, you know, that's going to be totally different as opposed to say a vertical strip where creatures can, and plants and animals can migrate northward with warming temperatures and rainfall patterns changing. And you know, what does it really mean in, in the oceans? If it's in the deep ocean versus coastlines, I mean, it makes a huge difference. And biodiversity is threatened most in these hotspots you know, those have, you know, if you if you protect an area in the middle of the Sahara Desert, it's going to have no impact, you know, versus protecting an area in, in the, say, a rainforest. So, so have you heard anything about discussions or is that too detailed? Well, those are examples of exactly the type of science that the Nature Conservancy does. So there have been studies, for example, that Nature Conservancy scientists have done that looked at the irrecoverable carbon in ecosystems, that if those areas are developed or if climate change continues unchecked, that the carbon released from those ecosystems would have a significant impact on global climate. And identifying those hotspots, one of which includes the western coast of Canada, those hotspots are the places that we have to prioritize for protection to prevent that carbon from being released into the atmosphere. 
So that's one way that the science can contribute. Another way the science can contribute is by identifying those biodiversity hotspots. So if you only have so much land that you can protect or so many resources to protect, what would those hotspots be? And that is the goal of the debt for nature swaps that the Nature Conservancy has been helping to um, broker. Where you take a country like Belize that has, or Bahamas, that have huge amounts of incredible biodiversity and crippling national debt. Finding them a partner, a financial institution or organization that will restructure their debt for a much lower interest rate, saving them lots of money on the condition that in exchange for those savings, they then have the resources they need, the financial resources to, in the case of Bahamas, protect 30% of their marine area. And if you're familiar with the Bahamas, it's more marine area than land. And before their debt for nature swap, they had almost no protected marine area. And in the case of Belize, setting aside unique, intact, untouched rainforest, that's another way that science and that policy, nature positive policies can help. But then there's one more thing that we've been doing is looking not only at where ecosystems and where species are today, but where they will be in the future as climate changes and looking at the pathways they take. And so that's a program at the Nature Conservancy called Resilient Networks, where there's this incredible graphic. I wish I could show you, but I'll just describe it to you so you can, you can sort of picture it. It starts off showing all of the biodiverse rich areas. The darker the color, the more biodiverse rich it is. And then it shows where they start to move as climate changes. And it turns out there is a corridor going right up the Appalachians into the Laurentians of incredible biodiversity richness moving northward as climate changes. So if you're gonna protect an area and build corridors, which as you said, you know, it's more important to build those corridors than it is just protect a round area in the middle of who knows where. The Appalachians, for example, is one place where science has identified that we really wanna make sure we keep those corridors open because climate is changing, ecosystems are adapting, but they have to have the ability to adapt. And as we fragment their ecosystems, that means that they can't move through, for example, the city of Chicago, you can't move through the city of Chicago to get to cooler places. Now, in terms of measuring biodiversity, I think, I think it's mostly, you know, you're, you're, counting numbers, you're counting different types of species, which is species richness. And you can also count numbers of species to see how healthy a population is. Um, but, you know, is this, this is not done all, all over the world. This is done in limited locations. Um, so there is some new, uh, uh, some new research on using DNA, iDNA, uh, where you take a sample of ocean water off a coast and you measure all of the DNA strands that you see and you identify the, the richness, all the different species, but also the numbers. Um, and if you do that in many locations, um, you can get a very good count on biodiversity and then you do it over time, you see how it changes. Um, do you, I mean, do you know how they do that on land? Like, does it, is, I mean, I can see it working well in the oceans where you get a nice distribution of, you know, water spread. Or on a coastline, for example, but over land, um, you know, I guess you could do it on a lake, shoreline, a river wouldn't really work because water is being carried. Soils, yeah, I guess. Yes. So, you know about that I know a little bit about it, and that's really exciting emerging work to literally take DNA samples from water. And they don't only do it in coastal areas, that's how they've discovered that there's a lot more life out way far away from coastal areas and in the deep ocean than they thought from doing DNA analysis. So on land, you can do the same from litter and soil analysis. You can just look at what is there. And we can learn so much that we never knew before about biodiversity, about richness, and about important areas to protect. The, I, I also read recently that we don't really know, have a good handle on exactly how many different species there are on this planet. I mean, and the, the number we were always throwing around, I think it went up a factor of four recently, something like that. And, uh, you know, we do seem to, you know, um, have a handle on the number of species extinctions, um, which, are, which are exceeding natural levels by, what, 100 times or something? Um, I, I, so I'm not sure. I mean, these are these are very educated guesses, I guess. Are they? I mean, I mean, do you have good faith in those numbers? Or well, for larger animals and plant species, yes. But for you know insects, for microbes, for very very small organisms that don't need a lot of space and might exist in very remote parts of the world, we really don't. And so that's where this DNA analysis, I think, can really move the needle on understanding what does life look like on this planet. Now, also, um, one, one 
one um, idea or concept I haven't heard discussed too much here is biogeography, and that's a bit different from biodiversity. So, you know, the reason why plants and animals live where they do is because of sort of things like average uh, mean temperatures yearly, mean temperatures in the summer, uh, extremes throughout the year, extremes throughout the day, rainfall, etc. So, one of the problems I think, you know, for example, if there's a wildfire that destroys a forest, we can't assume that a forest will regrow. Like it could be something totally different. It could be grasslands, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really the temperature, the uneven temperature distribution on the planet. Like global warming, we, you know, the average is fine. We can talk about the average, but you know, the Arctic is warming, people say four times faster than the rest of the planet now. And we're losing Arctic sea ice uh, very rapidly. We can go to a completely open Arctic, maybe, you know, 10 years, 20 years, uh, whatever. You know, that the trend is heading there. So, you know, what, um, I mean, what, what, so people, some people are talking about planetary or climate restoration, you know, trying to figure out ways to get CO2 levels, methane levels down to, you know, sort of pre-industrial levels. I mean, do you think that some of these things are possible? I mean, I think nature-based solutions will extract huge amounts of, of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, um, whereas a lot of people just think, well, we need to do it ourselves somehow. I don't, I don't know. Um, well, here's the thing. The first thing we have to do, so the way I think about it actually is, I think of the atmosphere like a swimming pool. And we had a natural level of water in the swimming pool that was just right. Imagine an above ground swimming pool where your toes just touch the ground. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a giant hose into our swimming pool and we've been turning that hose up every single year. During the first year of COVID, we turned it down 7% and then we turned it right back up again. So the first thing we have to do is we have to turn the hose off. That is the first thing. But our swimming pool also has a drain. We can make the drain bigger. And there's a third thing we have to do. We have to learn how to swim because the level of water in the pool is already too high. So all three of those things are important steps, but one of them by itself will not work. We have to do them all. So we have to turn off the hose. We have to make the drain bigger through nature as well as through technological solutions like direct air capture if they're cost effective. And we have to learn how to live in a warmer world. And so, yes, as we make the drain bigger and bigger, if we invest everything we can in nature, but nature itself is not enough, we don't have a planet big enough to take everything out of the atmosphere we put in there. So there would have to be technological solutions as well. Then we could eventually start to pull CO2 back out of the atmosphere. But there is no way to pull, it out, pull enough of it out of the atmosphere to actually decrease CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere if we don't turn the hose off. And that means weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. Yes, I, I love that. Um analogy or metaphor because you've, you've talked about um, adaptation, learning how to swim. You've talked about uh, the um, mitigation or, 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 or slashing fossil fuels, which is turning off the hose and also um, pulling out CO2 and reducing levels, which is opening the drain. So, I mean, that's a perfect, you know, analogy. I mean, it's too bad some of the politicians and government leaders didn't, you know, get it taught to them that way because it, it makes it makes perfect sense. So let's talk about people a bit more because in the climate system, there's all kinds of powerful feedbacks and cascading feedbacks like, you know, we lose Arctic sea ice that greatly increases melt rates of Greenland, sea levels up greatly increases melt rates of Antarctica. You know, uh, we lower the temperature difference uh, between the equator and the Arctic. So the jet streams get slower and wavier and wilder extreme weather. So all of these things are connected. You know, it's a huge system. And I, I think scientists, many of our scientists and many people around the world, all our jobs are very specialized. We need to, you know, I think we need more system thinkers you know, which is what I'm hearing from, from you. You know, it's looking at all the components and you talked about how, how um, improvements that help biodiversity also help the climate, also help people reduce poverty, you know, all these things. So, but you know, it's things that we have to do. Like we're, we're like the biggest feedback of all, right? I mean, so how do we, um, you know, we're the biggest tipping point of all. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I think that gives me a, a, a lot of hope. Um, so, um, so with the Nature Conservancy, you mentioned 
um, having a much bigger reach to scientists across the world. Like, use, and so, so one person in some lab finds something best practices. It could be, you know, applied, or one region of the world does something very useful to restore their bio, their system. You know, like you hear the story of one farmer in India plants a whole forest. Right, so things can, so, so this is like an exponential trigger to, on, on the positive side, which is much more of what we need. You know, we're all used to hearing them on the negative side, as you mentioned in your little study of the news. You know, very few neutral stories, very, a large number of, um, you know, uh, negative stories. So, so um, tell us some more about some of your ideas for, for the Nature Conservancy, what you, or Nature United in Canada for everybody. Um, you know, what, what sort of things, I mean, this gives you more leverage to, to get change, which is all very, sounds very hopeful. So what are, you, what are your sort of plans? We're almost, we're heading into 2023, this year's ending soon. And, uh, you know, what would you like to see happen with your organization and, and your own personal work too? Oh yeah, thank you. So we know that we don't have time. We know that we have to be acting as soon as possible, as much as possible. And what helps us accelerate is by not recreating the same wheel or redoing the same mistake. So what all of us need to do, and I mean all of us, is really increasing our information flow. So we know what works, why it works, how it works, and how we all need to be doing it. So within the Nature Conservancy, because we do nature-based solutions all around the world, in 80 countries around the world, and we have over 700 scientists working in all of those countries, there's a lot of science going on that at minimum we need to make sure is clearly communicated across our whole organization, but not only our organization, but all of the partners, all of the other organizations, all of the collaborators that we work with. But we as scientists too, we see a trend towards open access which is the same type of thing, removing the gatekeepers to knowledge that especially tend to keep out scientists in low-income countries that don't have the resources to access the scientific publications because the journal subscriptions are very expensive or the data sets or the software license is prohibitive. So the flow of information, I think, is absolutely critical to ensuring that we aren't reinventing wheels, but we're implementing what other people have learned and adding to it and enhancing it and improving on it and expanding on it. And that knowledge can be a catalyst for change. So that's an inter you know, a number of interesting points you've brought up. I mean, o open access to journals is great for the readership, but if scientists have to pay, you know, thousands of dollars to get a to get a paper in open access and they just don't have the research funding to do that, that could actually restrict uh, that. So, so it's not a perfect system. And uh, can you are you can you get all these uh, scientists at Nature Conservancy to get to get their blue stars on Twitter so that people recognize and say, hey, this is a recognized source. I mean, we have a big issue with social media right now, and uh, you know, so so it could go either way, you know. And this, you know, many people are going to other platforms and so on. So. I, you know, it, it's uh, it's going the right way, but you still have to have too much information can be a problem too, you. right? You want information from trusted sources, but trusted sources who are telling compelling stories that connect our heads to our hearts, to our hands. And so um, you have anticipated exactly one of the things which I would love to do, which is really encourage more Nature Conservancy scientists, but also encourage each other, our colleagues too, to be sharing in whatever way is genuine for them. So some of our colleagues are just outstanding on TikTok. Some people are great in terms of writing essays or blogs or longer pieces. Some people, you know, Twitter is really where it's at, 160 characters. Other people are really great on LinkedIn where you have longer, more sort of professional discussions. So just getting the word out. Some people, they might not be on social media at all, but they're talking to their kids' school or they're talking to the local Rotary Club or the local Lions Club, or they're talking to their church. Whoever we are, if we understand that it's real, it's us, it's serious, but there are solutions, we have the ability, we have everything we need to get out there and tell people this. Because to care about climate change, you only have to be one thing, and that one thing is quite literally a human being living on this planet. We also, um, there's a lot of factors in, in, in our favor for getting people more educated and, and that's that more and more people are being affected by climate change. Um, you know, I have some climate denier friends who have uh, c cottages in Prince Edward Island and they were just lifted off of their uh, bases by Hurricane Fiona in September. 
Um, you know, I have friends, you know, some climate change denier friends. Um, I don't discriminate in my friends. It's, you know, <laughs> they're friends, but I, I, maybe I should, but, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, they're, they're, they've lost their properties from, from flooding, you know, uh, friend. And I said, well, raise it up because it can happen again. And no, and then there was flooding, uh, there was a dry year and then a very wet year. And, you know, this is the climate, the weather whiplashing that, you, you know, it's, it's just, um, so they're becoming, you know, more and more, we're getting more and more people that are directly affected by, by climate change. So, I mean, have you, do you, have you been direct? There were a lot of climate scientists in Colorado, you know, that were affected. They lost their houses in the fires recently there. So um, have you been affected uh, personally? Um, like you're in Texas, right? So, you know, have you, have you, you had the power grid failure, I guess, in the winter. I mean, do you have some stories on how you were personally affected and say, oh, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I'm doing exactly the right thing. I couldn't be doing anything better with my life and career. I don't think that any of us don't have stories. If we don't think we have stories, it's simply because we're not opening our eyes to what's happening literally in the places where we live. So I see the signs all around me. So I grew up, um, you know, up in Muskoka, just north of Toronto, to, um, on a lake. And now we see completely different birds than we used to see before. It is warm enough to swim in the lake for weeks longer. I remember when I was little, one time the water got up over 80 degrees and my aunt called everybody to come to her place because she was in a shallow part of the lake and see that the thermometer said 80 degrees and everybody went swimming in what felt like bath water. Well, now the lake gets up to 80 degrees all the time and we're seeing the impacts on the ecosystems there. And when I was there a year ago last summer when we had the terrible wildfires out in BC, the smoke in Ontario or sorry, the, 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 the air in Ontario was bronze with the smoke from the wildfires from northern Ontario, but all the way from out west. So we are seeing changes here. In Texas, I live in the state that is most vulnerable to climate impacts. It already has more billion dollar weather and climate disasters than any other state. Supersized hurricanes, massive dust storms, record breaking droughts and floods going so fast from one to the other it practically gives you whiplash. So we're seeing the impacts wherever we live and that is the important accelerator of change is recognizing that it's not just in the future, it's now. It's not just over there, it's here. Whoever we are, wherever we live, we are experiencing the impacts in ways that matter to all of us. So, so this is so the last thing. Um, I would, um, can't keep you here all day. I'd like to as much as I'd like to, but uh, but <laughs> but. Um, it used to be, you know, we're all attached to our homes and our home we consider, you know, maybe where we grew up or where we were born. We have a special attachment to that. And, you know, when we move away somewhere else, um, you know, we would have this draw and want to return home at some point. It's like it's like an, it's in our human nature, I think. Um, but now um, because of abrupt climate change, rapid climate change, you don't have to move away. Your home is is changing, right? So so it's leading to a lot of climate anxiety. So just, uh, you know, I asked you at the beginning, so we'll kind of conclude, you know, about dealing with the anxiety, because a lot of young people are feeling it a lot more because, uh, you know, they know they have a much, they have, they have a long life ahead of them, hopefully, and they're really panicking or worried and, you know, um, you know, Greta has been great for, 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 for raising awareness, but, but you know, young women are, are saying, "I don't want to have kids and things." That's very sad. So, so how do we, how do we, how do we um, deal with this? I guess it's it's not just educating ourselves, but you know, whether it be spiritual or better understanding or you know, faith or you know, whatever whatever way. So I so I don't know. There, there's a lot of strategy. Compartmentalization. That's not a healthy strategy. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well. So, so the first thing I think yeah. to start with is the fact that if if you feel anxious, if you feel angry, if you feel sad, if you feel depressed or paralyzed or overwhelmed or helpless, that is a rational response to what's happening today. It is not abnormal. It is not strange. It is a completely rational response to what the science is telling us and to what we see governments around the world not doing. So that's where we have to start. That is a absolutely normal response. And then the question is, what do we do with it? Because if we immerse ourselves in anxiety, if we allow ourselves to be paralyzed by that fear, that is not going to lead us to a better future. And what we all want is that better future.
And so we have to use that anxiety. We have to use that feeling of just of anger or pain or grief over what we're losing to spur us to action. And it was Joan Baez who said a very long time ago that the antidote to anxiety is action. When we make a difference, when we take action and we join with others, so it's not individual, but it's working collectively with each other, we all have days when we feel like it is not worth it. We need a break. But we need to be around other people who say, we've got it. You take a break. You should take a break. Self-care is a form of climate action. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Spending time doing the things that we love in the places that we love with the people we love is climate action because what it does is it reminds us of why we're fighting. So that's why I wrote my book last year, Saving Us. I wrote it specifically, not for people who question the science on climate change. I wrote it for everybody who completely accepts the science of climate change, but is paralyzed by the information that science gives us. I'm a scientist, so I get this information every day. You're, you get this information every day too. We know what's happening to our world, but we also know that the greatest uncertainty in the future is us. We hold the future in our hands, and if we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed, on a regular basis. We all have days when we're overwhelmed, believe me. But if we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed completely on a regular basis such that we don't do anything about it, the worst case scenario will happen. But if we fight with everything we have for that small chance of a better future, that fight is what will give us that chance. Wonderful uh, words of wisdom. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to, to chat. And uh, I want to thank all of the viewers for, for watching this. And, uh, you know, please uh, subscribe and uh, click, uh, you know, and share uh, these videos that we do often with from uh, the climateemergencyforum.org. Thank you again, Catherine.